Uh, thank you again all for joining us. Uh, my name is Rich, part of the team here at Glidescope. We could have had as our sort of icebreaker welcome question, um, uh, how much of your childhood um, does this image resonate with? Uh, were Transformers a thing for you? Are you looking at it going, that was a toy? Uh, we're not going to do that, but uh, it is something which we could have probably an, an hour's worth of discussion on just on that. Um, before we get into the meat of today, quick uh, points on how we are running today's session. We are a large group, uh, so uh, vocal cords, other than for our speakers, can remain largely rested for the next 58 minutes or so. Uh, we are going to be using chat. We are going to be using Menti. Please do use those. Um, if you want to use uh, Twitter, please do. The transformation trap is our hashtag for today. Um, we're running through until two o'clock. We'll have a hard finish at two. Uh, but if you are left at 201 going, oh, there's another comment I really want to chuck in, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, and um, if your tech decides that the cold is too much for it, uh, Grant is on standby uh, to help with any tech woes, um, preferably restricted to this event rather than why doesn't my Black Friday purchase do as it was advertised? But you could try Grant for that as well. Um, of course, do be aware of Teams fatigue. We won't ask people how many Teams meetings they've already joined today. Uh, but of course, uh, if you've got distractions off screen, please do feel free to deal with those. Uh, we are recording today's event. Uh, welcome to you from the future if you are joining uh, later on. Um, if you have any concerns, do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, use captions if that is useful. Um, and if you're not able to see different parts, um, uh, the age old tech advice of uh, switch it off, switch it back on again, probably will help you out. But if not, Grant is there if it is needed. Um, if you're wondering uh, what it is that you've joined and who is hosting you today, uh, recap that we are Kaleidoscope. Uh, we are both a cause and a consultancy. Uh, we are a not-for-profit social enterprise. Uh, our mission is to work with others to build a future which is kind, connected and joyful. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by providing consultancy services uh, to a range of folk across health and care. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years now. Um, and it's lovely to see some familiar names and faces popping up uh, today. Um, possibly you could uh, pin your pin your name to some of those logos beneath. Um, what are we up to today? Uh, so four objectives, four objectives, and hopefully these tally with why you chose to join today. Uh, so our theme is this transformation trap. What do we mean by that? How do we escape without losing hope uh, is our first objective. Um, we're going to do that by trying to build a greater understanding of how change really happens and doesn't happen within healthcare. We're going to be sharing some hopefully quite practical tips, tricks, uh, approaches, uh, which you can take away uh, and use to um, uh, in your day jobs from two o'clock this afternoon, as well as creating new connections across health and care. Uh, we have arbitrarily divided up the time between now and two o'clock to cover some of those points. Uh, you'll be hearing from a superstar panel of stars, uh, Tanya Carter, Dan Grimes, Rebecca Myers. I'll allow them to introduce themselves uh, as we go through, uh, as well as my friend and colleague Shane Carmichael from Kaleidoscope. Um, I'm afraid you've got to deal with a bit of me as well, uh, Rich Taunt, part of the Kaleidoscope team. Um, we are a large group. We're not going to do introductions by some uh, going around the houses uh, horror show, uh, but we are going to pop across to Menti, if that's OK. We're going to pop across to Menti. So you will see um, a link popping up in chat in just one moment. But also you can scan that QR code or go to menti.com 86 20 98 So there's a link in chat or you can scan the QR code. Uh, or go to menti.com 8620 um, just to join on Menti. Menti, if you haven't used it before, a uh, handy little tool for moments such as this. First off, first off, where are you joining us from today? Where are you joining us from today? Uh, it's Map of the UK. Um, hopefully that's, that's quite apparent. Um, if you're joining us from outside the UK, a very warm welcome to you. Um, and you do feel free to place a dot 
in the sea nearest to um uh to where you are joining us from um where are you joining us from today that might be somewhere very different to where you do most of your work uh, but where are you joining us from today hooray we do have a dot in the sea um if you want to say in chat where that's uh, alluding to it's a, sort of a, a, a canadian type trajectory um uh, could be elsewhere do say in chat lovely thank you very much indeed um great to see that we have England, Wales and Scotland represented um, as well as the ocean. Uh, that's that's good um, and warm welcome to you all. Um, this is the latest in a series of these events. Um, and for some reason, we, we, we fail to attract people from either East Anglia or Cornwall. So objective for next time is um, how do we reach the parts which Kaleidoscope hasn't managed to do so far? Uh, lovely spread. Thank you very much indeed. So in terms of the work that you do, we are making a presumption uh, that you're joining today because the business of transformation, the business of change. Um, oh, Sheila, welcome. Um, uh, lovely to have you with us. Uh, the business of change being something that you are doing um, regularly in your work. But actually, what's the setting for that? And it might be across different areas, but primarily, where are you doing your transformation or change? Um, yes, the privacy of your own home is a uh, legitimate answer here. Um, but we will likely, as we are seeing, come from a range of different viewpoints. So... Oh, Maggie, joined from New York. Maggie, it's lovely to have you with us as well. Um, where are you doing your transformation change? Uh, great, a nice slug from um, Integrated Care Boards. Thank you. Uh, from Acute uh, VCSE, lovely. That's great to see. Um, good to have some local government representation um, outside health and care as well, as well as within the of your own home. We'll give this just one more moment. Again, part of the objective today is to think about change across across boundaries. And so it's lovely to have that spread there. Thank you all. Um, uh, two more. So one of the one of the areas we're going to be getting into today is actually about the different types of change and how we think about the different types of change within health and care. So um, highly scientific, uh, two by two grid. Just ask you to think about where where mostly does your work situate? Uh, if it covers everything, you can just put a dot in the middle. But is it smaller, more incremental change? Is it sort of larger, more radical? That's sort of where, that's your up down axis. And then side to side, is it is it proactive? Is it getting ahead of the game, or reactive, sort of coming um, to respond to events outside of your control? Um, it's the first time we've used this grid on Menti and fascinating to see results. Uh, so um, a sort of a tendency towards the more larger, uh, more radical, more than the, the smaller, more towards proactive, which is great to see um, less on the reactive side. So that quadrant, the sort of proactive, larger, larger group being the most prominent today. Um, thank you. We're going to return to that. As we go through last one, and then we're gonna then we're gonna crack on. Um, you submitted some wonderful questions ahead of time. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, we had over a hundred questions, which we've <laughs> synthesised as best we can and brought it down to five in particular. So, of these questions, if there was one, if there was one which we must answer, uh, or no one else, no one gets out alive, which should that be? So, your five choices. Uh, how do you ensure more commitment to consistent change over time as needed for overnight transformation? How do we balance hope and ambition with often harsh reality when it comes to making change? How do you preserve enough capacity for transformation as well as business as usual without making transformation someone else's job? And how do we make small steps that build confidence in progress towards effective change in the face of enormous scale and bureaucracy? Or finally, you might just be asking, oh, well, where do I start? Where do I start? Uh, how do you maintain your own hope, hope slash sanity as a transformational change director? I'll give people just a moment longer um, and then we will come back to our most popular questions with our superstar panel as we go through. It's a second longer. 
Thank you again, everyone. If you are just joining us now, very warm welcome. I'm Rich, part of the Glyscope team. Uh, we are recording today's session. Uh, so if you're wanting to watch back uh, what we've been doing, you'll be able to do that as well. Um, great stuff. So that how do you ensure, how do you preserve enough capacity for transformation, as well as business as usual, without making sure someone else's job uh, nudging others out. Uh, it sounds like people are clear about where they start. That's positive in itself. Lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll return to that. Um, we're going to start. We're going to start. And our, our first speaker is the um, superstar that is Shane. Shane, Transformation Trap, Grounded Hope. Um, over to your good self. Thanks so much, uh, Rich. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who has taken the time to join. Uh, so uh, my job is uh, to uh, set the scene and provide a little bit of uh, provocation um, through uh, a process of both a uh, humble suggestion um, and uh, hopefully a little bit of grounded hope on change that works. Um, so Rich, let's uh, go to the next slide. So we are obsessed about change and transformation. Um, the reason we work for a social enterprise, uh, which takes its not-for-profit uh, status very seriously, um, a little too seriously probably, um, we're not here for the money, we're here to do good in the world. We really, really get out of bed in the morning to try in some way, however small, to make a change, to make a difference. Um, we all work in the service. We some of us continue to work in the service. I'm lucky to teach at UCL on this. I'm a trustee at a, a mental health care provider. We believe in this stuff. Um, and uh, this is just a, a screen scrape of all the other people or some of the other people um, who also believe in this stuff. Uh, and not just believe in it, who've seen it happen. So uh, Rebecca, who you'll hear from a little bit, talked about, and I talked yesterday, about some of the amazing things that we've seen in our lifetime in health care. So we're certainly not anti-transformation. Um, however, say a prayer for the uh, Isle of Man Health Transformation Team uh, appearing uh, soon in a special mashup edition of Location, Location, Location meets Transformation, Transformation, Transformation. Um, uh, what was interesting to note is um, at, any given, at this given moment, there are 500 pages of online events associated with the word transformations. That's 500 pages. Um, I scrolled through pretty much every one of those and uh, I have chosen the one that I will be joining ASAP. It's, how, it's called Claim Your Magic Dragon, uh, $37, Sheila. I'm not sure what the, uh, the conversion rate is on that. Um, but um, uh, thank you for joining us uh, and rather the Magic Dragon Brigade. So if we're so uh, positive and passionate about transformation and change, What's this miserable trap uh, uh, headline about? Uh, we're definitely the only uh, skeptic uh, in those 500 pages as far as I can see, uh, Rich. So here's the problem. Um, one of our values is transparency, even over comfort. Um, and we are having increasingly more um, uncomfort uncomfortable or discomforting conversations with our partners, our clients, uh, with colleagues about a tension between two mental models that are competing and we think increasingly unhelpfully with each other. So on the right uh, is um, often how uh, a lot of uh, us um, uh, describe or experience those two mental models, uh, A to B, and then we step outside of uh, whatever uh, room we happen to be in and we encounter the reality of the world, the beautiful and messy reality that is health and care. But what are we actually experiencing um, as this and this story builds? What we're seeing is we feel a misunderstanding or misuse of the idea of transformation as an act or a moment in time, rather than what we think it's intended to be, which is a, a bold intention or a process that is likely to be challenging over time. And what that's driving then is unconsidered or unintentionally unconsidered transformation. That drives unrealistic expectations, particularly we're seeing this euphemism of more for less. There's then a dissonance between what is anticipated and what's experienced, to use a lovely phrase my colleague Katie uh, talks to. That drives impatience and intervention uh, of various types, repent, resign or restructure, um, sometimes uh, all together. That seems to be driving a sense of frustration and powerlessness. We're seeing a lot of suffering uh, with our clients and partners about it's all too big, like you know, how can we move forward? And then cynicism, a sad but very natural, I think, and, and um, uh, uh, reasonable cynicism about um, attempts at change. And while all that's happening, the real work, the real work of change seems to be increasingly getting pushed out or undervalued. So that's what we're interested in, this idea of these, this dissonance. Thank you, Rich. 
So, however, you don't agree, which is fantastic. Um, so, uh, in praise of non-groupthink, we asked you what the, the you thought the idea of transformation health and care is, and this is what you told us. So, no one thinks it's a trap. Uh, even fewer people think it's a myth, uh, which is either good or alarming. Um, but everyone, uh, well, 60% of you almost thought it was a necessity for hope, and uh, the rest thought it was all of the above. So it's serving us in some way. So question in chat, what story is the donut of transformation, which we've called it after some considerable thought, telling us about ourselves and our work in the world? And so um, just give a few seconds for those to start to come in. So if we were going to hang this in the tit, what would be the little uh, little description uh, off to you um, off to right? Yeah. It's coming in. Okay, Rich, we'll, um, we'll pop that. Um, Pop on just in uh, the interest of time, but looking forward to seeing those um, uh, those descriptors. Uh, so, um, what have we been attending to? So, we have been spending a lot of time with these lovely people, um, and actually drawing on some of our own work, um, changing healthcare, learning from lasting change in the NHS, where we looked at things like CMD surgery, uh, MR, uh, MRSA, etc. How change really happens, um, how it happens over time. Um, so change that leads to transformation. So how are these things turning up in our work? Um, they're turning up in two ways. One, first through a rather pessimistic lens, so Rich, if you can just knock that on. Um, so we've been doing a bit of a post-mortem, pre-mortem. So in the literature, in our experience, these are the reasons that change fails. So what we're trying to do is sort of trying to doom ourselves to repeating history, but we're also trying to, to remind ourselves that just understanding uh, failure is necessary, but it's not sufficient because change that does work isn't just a function of not doing these things. There's some other stuff turning up. There's a little bit of magic um, magic uh, happening outside of just turning this on its head. And you can read a little bit more about this in, um, in our blog, uh, which a colleague will post. So what is the magic, uh, the magic sauce? Well, um, Magic ingredients, magic sauce. I feel like I'm in, um, in a very bad, uh, low-budget uh, MasterChef uh, uh, version of uh, um, of this uh, this event. Um, so change that works. This is what we're seeing. So first change that works meets people where they are. We're doing. Uh, are talking a lot about trauma-informed change. We are meeting more and more people, um, partners, clients, colleagues, who need to really be heard. It's very hard. Um, to ask someone to engage in yet another uh, change endeavor if we don't uh, if we're not honest about the the trauma um the 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 fear the loss that comes with that um we are um seeing change of work as really deliberate and planned there's there's an absence of um uh, uh, an absence of um uh, a sort of a hope over experience we're seeing more and more drawing on behavioral science industrial psychology um, and so forth um, it is owned by those who do the work one of myron's maxims um, uh, and it prioritizes real progress today, this idea of momentum, the idea that actually you get progress from doing the work itself, from starting to make progress, even the smallest unit of, um, of progress. And of course, um, curiosity, courage and accountability turn up. One of our worries about psychological safety, for example, is that you can have high psychological safety but without high levels of accountability and courage. You're not really going uh, going any further forward. So you can read more about these in a little bit more detail uh, on um, in our blog and on the website. All right, thank you. And then just finally, um, a little bit of our lived experience. What we're finding is when we take these six these six ingredients and we combine them to some of the frameworks that we use, there are two here: one on effective collaborations, one on high performing teams. You actually do see both change that works and change that brings hope, that brings agency, that creates a sense of possibility that does in very quick order lead to what is being described by our partners and clients as a transformative um, experience. And that's the business that we want to be in and that's the conversation we want to have today. How can we as a community invest in change that works, that brings hope and do that at pace?
Shane, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. What a great way to set the scene for today. Uh, we're now going to come to our speakers. We're going to hear first from Tanya, then from Dan, then from Rebecca. I will allow them to introduce themselves where we've given them uh, no time and a uh, high to-do list, so insert metaphor here. Uh, but we're looking for uh, sort of the philosophy, you know, is transformation a trap? Is it necessary for hope? Interesting responses in chat already, thank you. Uh, what really characterises change that works uh, and what practical practices uh, can help bring hope faster? Um, Tanya, I think we're going to come to you first. Good afternoon, Tanya. Good afternoon, Rich. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Tanya Carter. I'm the Chief People Officer and I work for East London NHS Foundation Trust, um, which provides mental health, community and primary care. Um, in addition, I'm also the co-chair of the London HR Director Network. Um, so I'll be talking to you very much from a, from a provider, from an operational, from a transactional HR. And we had that conversation about, you know, you're either HR or OD. I, I'm, I'm yet to meet an expert in both. Um, but I am the HR, trans I am the transactional HR person who has learned uh, and acquired HR skills along the way. So that's the perspective for which I, I come to this. So um, I was really encouraged when I saw the donut because I too um, felt that it was all of the above. Um, but it, if I had to rank them in order, I would say, firstly, it's hope. And sometimes um, the intention uh, is not articulated and clearly enough and the vision's not clear enough and then it becomes a myth and then it becomes a trap and um, and so that 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 was um it was interesting to see that a number of people kind of categorize that in the same way um i think for me um and my experience and what i've observed in health i think transformation is often misunderstood i think an intent is there and i think because it's not clear it goes nowhere fast and i think often you will have a transformation team that going to come in and, and, and change the world and then you've got the business as usual team that's kind of left behind and neither is talking to each other um, and I say that also from my stint in consulting you know you're often brought in to, to fix a problem but the people who are on the ground doing the do are very often not at the heart of the conversation and um, so it's absolutely ne uh, necessary for hope particularly in this context of the current financial climate particularly in the public sector um, and I think sometimes it doesn't deliver what it set out. It hasn't delivered what, what was promised. And therefore, that's where, in my opinion, it can become a myth. I think closely linked to that um, in terms of the philosophy of change. You know, being a HR professional and going through my training, I remember it was information, consultation and engagement. When actually, I think it should be the other way around. It should be engagement, information and then consultation. And the consultation being the last bit having engaged with the people who know best. And I think sometimes we get that wrong. Um, I mentioned um, before, just in terms of my journey, trying to, cross, trying to cross over more into the OD sphere, I learned a lesson late on because I was very much, you know, what's the task, what's the task, what are we trying to achieve, how are we going to get there, how quickly is it going to get done? Much to my surprise, when I went to don't do the NTL OD programme, I learned actually it's maintenance, 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 and the task will hand, handle itself. And I think it's a really difficult concept because, from my perspective, you need to go slow to go fast. Um, and in this current climate of, you know, productivity, financial cuts, etc., I think that's um, a hard concept to sell. And um, the most tangible um, example I can think about was, you know, my, my, my team was growing in terms of people and bodies, but the, you know, the office space that we had was limited. And so we started to talk about, OK, you know, let's become agile. Let's do away with, you know, fixed desks. Let's just, you know, to me, it was a simple administrative change that wasn't going to be that. It wasn't going to affect me significantly. But OMG, much to my surprise, you know, the resistance was immense. And um, I kid you not, I spent 12 months, maybe a little bit more talking about it which was a bit frustrating because I knew what the end game was I knew what I wanted to achieve I thought I knew how I wanted to get there and I just wanted to get it done but I recognized without getting the buy-in and for people to own and believe it wasn't going to happen and so we talked about becoming an agile service for about 12 months and then during that time it was about okay you know 
you choose the furniture, you choose the design, you choose the layout, like you choose everything, I'll just sign the check. And it was about how I got people in the service to kind of own that change, be on the front line and kind of bring um, everyone with them. Um, but we did, we went really slow. And then it became a vision. People could see what I could see. And then we were able to speed up. And I'm going to give you dates because it's really important. So on the 6th of January, 2020, we cut the ribbon on the office. So we had these new Google-style offices. Everybody got brand new kit, laptop, phone, etc. 6th of January, 2020. And on the 20th of March, 2020, we went into lockdown. And the thing that everybody resisted as the worst thing became, oh my God, how you must have known this was coming. How, you know, you must have, you must be a witch. And then it became just, oh my God. So I was able on the 20th to say, right, everybody go home, go home and I'll see you online. And, and then there was the whole thing about how to learn teams and do remote working and lead people remotely. That's a conversation for another day. But um, I think that was probably my biggest, most impactful mechanism on change and then having to explain to the organization yeah yeah yeah, agile coming you know we're working on it we're getting there and people couldn't understand what they were talking about you know we just want people to work differently but what I learned you know people are you know that they have their space they want their photos and you know people are um, attached and it felt like we were taking something from them so yeah that was my uh, learning about maintenance and go slow to go fast and it has served us well and now we're having to follow the next iteration around how do you manage remotely? How do you work in a hybrid way? How do you manage performance when you can't see people? Um, so that's really interesting. And I think fundamentally, I think we forget the focus. We forget the impact change on people, irrespective of how small we might think that change might be. Um, and then I come to productivity, which I think is a bit like transformation. I, it, it, I had a lot, but we we're rarely good at explaining the case of what, what do we mean by productivity. And I think as services as HR practitioners, um, we need to get better at articulating what we, you know, better articulation of what the issue is, better articulation and better understanding of the data and how we use the data to, to do the better articulation. Um, and our narrative. You know, the, the numbers only tell a part of the story. And so how do we be more, um, how do we slick up, essentially, at, at kind of addressing those challenges? And how do we make sense of it all? Um, I've kind of conflated the three areas, the three questions. I think I have covered everything. Um, but for me, there's also that whole, that whole uh, theoretical piece around unfree change and refree. And that is just so important because, after all, we're dealing with people, right? Um, I am conscious of the time, so I'm gonna. That's pretty much all I think I needed to say. Um, but yeah, for me, it's about hope and it's about empowerment and um, bringing the right people along and actually sometimes giving them the keys to drive and just yeah. So I mean, hopefully, you've taken something from that. I will stop talking and I'll take any questions. And then apologies, I do have to drop off sharply because I'm I've, I've got to go back to my board meeting. Thank you. Tanya, thank you very much indeed. We're all in different places, but if we can show our appreciation wherever we are. Tanya, thank you. We're going to come to uh, Dan next. Good afternoon, Dan. I'll allow you to introduce yourself um, and talk about our, our, our three points. Dan. Thanks, Rich. Um, so my name is Dan Grimes. I, um, I, I have a joint role between uh, an organisation called Mersey Care, which is a big community and mental health provider in Liverpool, uh, and uh, the acute hospitals in the city, uh, Liverpool University Hospital. So uh, my role sits in between both those organisations. But my my views on transformation are really informed by my kind of professional practice to date, the vast majority of which has been in operational management, largely actually in, a, in an acute hospital setting. So, uh, so my views, I suppose, are going to come from, they're going to be very heavily kind of flavoured with that perspective. But um, uh, but I hope it's helpful wherever you are in the kind of uh, health and care system or beyond. Um, and uh, these are really interesting questions because I think they really have prompted me to think about what are the things that I believe in and what are the things that I believe work and don't work. So it's been dead it's been dead helpful for me to kind of prepare uh, for this session. What what it kind of has con 
uh, cemented for me is transformation and change, I think, for me, are indivisible from improvement. Um, so that that is the first thing I would say. A transformation is a means, not an end. Uh, and so the the kind of the the transformation uh, in and of itself is only useful if it gets us to a better place, whatever that place might be, uh, in whatever part of the world we're looking at. And, and I suppose for those people who work and have worked in organizations where there's a really strong continuous improvement focus, and I've been very lucky to work in some organizations like that, transformation then becomes a state of being. It is knitted into the fabric of your culture because you are constantly striving to improve. But for those people who come from who come to transformation from a discontinuous perspective, I still think there's lots in improvement methodology and improvement science that can help inform practices and um, and principles to how we might address transformation. Um, so taking that point about transformation as a means, not an end, um, I think for me, really kind of basic principles of transformation are it's got to be aims focused. And, and there are a couple of uh, improvement um, uh, models, which some of, some of them might be familiar to you. So apologies if I'm teaching this. Okay. Some of them might not be, but if they're not, I would highly encourage you to look into them a bit further. The first is the Institute for Health Improvements model for improvement. And it just starts with three really simple questions, which is what are we trying to do? What's the thing we're trying to improve? How will we know that we've done it? Uh, so how will we measure uh, our improvement? And not necessarily all quantitatively, but there has to be a sense of we understand when we've got to an improved state. And then the third thing is, what changes can we make then to influence that improvement? And I think those are really fundamental questions for transformation and improvement professionals. What are we trying to do? How will we know whether or not we've done it? And then what are the things that we're going to do to try to get to that new state? And the other bit of kind of improvement theory that I would really uh, encourage you to kind of uh, uh, look at in this in this regard is the system of profound knowledge or the lens of profound knowledge, um, which is, again, a, a really fundamental principle of quality improvement. And, and again, it's really important because it's aims focused. So the system of profound knowledge, it, it's all about what is the thing that we're trying to do. And I think that's a really critical uh, point for all transformation professionals. And then within that, it, it encourages you to focus on four interconnected uh, areas of focus. Uh, and those are, do we understand the system that we're operating in? And understanding of the system only comes from zooming out. So you can only understand a system. You can't understand a system by analyzing the component parts. You can only understand a system by understanding the connectivity that sits between the parts of that system. And when I say system here, I'm talking about this could be as simple as, you know, uh, departments within a hospital. And it could be as broad as, you know, the national health and social care system. But we only understand the systems of it by zooming out. Do we understand how that system performs? And again, this is relates to the aims that we're trying. So what are the things that we measure to understand the variability in performance of that system? How are we going to apply kind of a scientific approach to trying to, to influence improvement? So something that, that is called a the theory of knowledge within the, the, the profound knowledge lens, which is designed to get us over our conscious and unconscious biases. It's designed to kind of uh, encourage us to be curious, but in a way that uses tools which are well developed for that purpose and there are loads of those in improvement science and then the fourth one and this is dead important especially for transformational professionals i think is um what is the psychology that's at play do we understand what's happening for people within this system and do we understand how people are why people are behaving the way that they're behaving and the interactions between people within that system um and uh, behavioral science is an enormous component, I think, of any transformational change. And it's one that we we, are, we frequently don't have a lot of insight or skills into. That's why OD professionals, I think, are incredibly useful and valuable in that regard, because they bring that knowledge and expertise. But we've got to ask for it. If we're trying to change anything, if we're trying to transform anything, we have to pay attention to what's happening with the people. Uh, otherwise, we're never going to change anything. And And this comes back to the 
the Myron's Maxims things, which, you know, I can see in the chat, other people, big fans of Myron's Maxims, but the two that, that kind of resonate with me in this regard are real change takes place in real work. So, uh, so things have not changed unless the work has changed. Uh, and so us kidding ourselves that things have changed because we've set up a load of new governance infrastructure or we've gone to a couple of meetings, that isn't change. Um, so real change takes place in real work. And the second is the people who do the work do the change. So it, the work will only have changed if the people doing it change the way that they work. And that's why I think it's so desperately important that as part of any kind of transformational endeavor, we really take time to understand who are the people and what's driving current behaviors and what are the things that we would need to pay attention to if we wanted to change some of those behaviors um, towards that end. Um, so the practices, I think for me, again, they link back to improvement practices. So there's loads of stuff out there um, that I found helpful over the years. Uh, the Breakthrough Series Collaboratives, again, the IHI stuff are dead helpful. We did a really, uh, it was really important to me, piece of work at uh, when I went to Oldham Hospital around improving kindness within the organization. And we used the Breakthrough Series Collaborative approach to do that, just to wrap some method around it, really. Um, and it was incredibly helpful because it, it allowed us to have conversations in a way that um, was improvement focused, but it also gave permission to people to kind of call stuff out that wasn't good. Um, and it created a sense of uh, energy around it. And it framed our work so that it wasn't just kind of warm word stuff, which I think is a real uh, danger sometimes. So it gave us some impetus and some momentum to actually change and do some practical things. So I, I'm a big advocate for big Breakthrough Series Collaborative, but there's loads of other stuff, you know, rapid improvement events, clinical microsystems work, whatever. It, but I, I would say make sure it's kind of founded in in theory um and, and because it's important because there are things that work out there um the i suppose the the last thing because we, we were also asked about what what might be some of the pitfalls that's a p word isn't it shane uh, so what are some of the pitfalls or the pressures and politics that might get in the way of, of transformation i think tanya's already mentioned one about the pressure to perform uh, and often that can override um uh, uh, you know, an improvement approach because doing something is seen as more important than doing something properly, maybe. Uh, and I think that is a real challenge. I, I also think one of the other real challenges um, is, uh, is a tendency to want to oversimplify everything. Um, and, and I think that is a real pitfall. Now, I've got a book here, I'm going to stop in a second, sorry, but uh, which is it's called Nine and a Half Things Disney Would Do Differently If They Ran Your Hospital. And the reason why I like this book is because I used to work for Disney. Uh, I was a hotel receptionist at Disneyland Paris uh, while I was at university and uh, and I work in hospitals. So it kind of it's, uh, you know, it ticks two boxes for me. Uh, and one of the quotes in it says, someone has said, I'm not interested in simplicity on this side of complexity. I'm only interested in simplicity on the other side of complexity. And then it's a really important job for leaders in transformation to try to get to that nirvana of simplicity on the other side of complexity. It says simplicity is the first level of simplicity is born of ignorance when somebody said, oh, that's simple, but they don't really understand what they're talking about. The next phase is paralyzing because it's complexity where you become overwhelmed. Um, but the third level is simplicity born of profound understanding. And I think it's incumbent on all of us who kind of do transformational change and leadership in that space. That's where we need to be to be able to take our people with us. We need to have a profound understanding of what is the thing that we're trying to change so that we can make it simple for people to follow. Dan, lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Bill. Show our appreciation. Dan, thank you. Um, I feel at this point it's beholden on me to say other theme parks are available, um, although they may not have um, accompanying um, uh, management books. Um, we're going to come to Rebecca in just a second, but look, if you thought you were joining an important conversation, probably you might not have expected it to cover witchcraft from Tanya, profound knowledge from Dan. So, um, Rebecca, over to you. Do you, can you sort of, you know, how, how are you going to raise this bar? Uh, but I'll allow you to introduce yourself. Rebecca. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, having me today. I'm Rebecca. Um, and uh, where I'm coming from today, I suppose, is um, as a fallible human being, 
trying to find my way through uh, transformation. Um, I have a number of roles. I wear multiple hats. So my background is I'm a clinician. I'm a registered nurse, worked in community and acute hospitals. I've also served on hospital boards, uh, voluntary sector boards, um, and also uh, uh, recently just completed a doctorate looking at um, risk and emotions in healthcare. So my practice and my views are shaped by a lot of theory and a lot of experience. And I think that's really important because when we often talk about um, work that we do, there's sort of claim of objectivity, I think, uh, steps in. And I suppose my argument is that none of us are objective. We all bring our own biases and prejudices. And so here are some of mine about what informing them. So when I was thinking about transforming, I've made some notes as well, just so that I can remember things. But when I was thinking about this idea of transforming, I'm very interested in words and what does the word mean? So the first thing I was thinking about, well, OK, let's look at the definition. And the idea of transformation is that there is a marked change in the form or um, appearance of something. Um, and I think also implied in that, that transformation is always a good thing. Uh, and I suppose my first point is I might question that. Um, I think when we're thinking about, you know, is there transformation in the health service? And I think the health service and social care and public sector generally are often criticised as not being very innovative or transform transformative. One of the things that I do is I run a leadership programme for clinicians. And on the first workshop, we map out the timeline of the health service from when it started to the current day. Uh, and actually what you'll see is there a significant change happening all the time uh, with quite major changes uh, and the health service of today is very different from the health service that I joined 30 years ago. Um, so I suppose I'm rejecting this idea that transformation in health social care is a myth but I do think that the word or the expectation of the word transformation can and has become problematic as people have said and I think it sets up this expectation um, I shared with Shane that one of the jobs that I was given was um, to be a transformation director. And the first thing I negotiated was changing the title because I felt like I had to turn up at work each day dressed as Wonder Woman with my knickers on the outside of my tights uh, and couldn't deliver. So I wanted to manage the expectations for myself and for others. Um, but I think, does that therefore make it a trap? Um, and I suppose I started to wonder, well, what do we mean by this idea of a trap? You know, what is behind this need for transformation? Who decides things need to be transformed and how transparent are we about that transformation? Um, it made me think about different transformations that I've been involved in. Um, and I think Shane referenced this idea that sometimes the claim for transformation is actually a euphemism for saving costs. Uh, and I think that people aren't silly and they recognise that. And so that becomes problematic if people feel that you're not being upfront with them. Uh, I think that also when we engage in that, then you start to notice about when our solution to a problem becomes the problem itself. And I think perhaps transformation might be something that we've got into, that we see transformation as a solution to our challenges in terms of some of the problems in healthcare. Um, and actually that transformation is starting to become a problem and some of the weariness that people were talking about may be kicking in. Uh, and I think if you're interested in that, there's a great book called Principles of Problem Formation and Problem Resolution. And it's written by Paul Vatslevic and John Weakland. Uh, so I would recommend that if you're interested. Um, I think also the other thing is transformation implies that things need to change. Um, and I think there is something that others have said about really understanding well, what's going on and why. Um, and I think it's important to do that from a plurality of perspectives. I think one of the things is a great quote that I like, which says that characterizing the problematic situation in certain ways can make one look for certain kinds of solutions. But often one's initial characterization might be misguided and inaccurate and thus might be the main reason for keeping one stuck. And I think that often rings true. But I think, as people have said in the donut, there is this necessity or necess you know, desire for hope. And I think that's quite interesting. So why do we want hope? What does hope do? I think hope has a purpose. It tries to um, protect us against despair and despondency. Um, but also, perhaps at the same time, it acts as a defence mechanism to facing reality of the situation. And we can find ourselves in positions of false hope, which perhaps don't help us either.
during my doctoral research, I became really interested in this concept of alienation because I noticed myself feeling alienated and I noted others around me feeling alienated too. And I was curious about that. And part of that was, I think, as the, the diagram at the beginning showed about this disconnect between what people were publicly saying was needed and going on and what people were privately saying about what was needed and what was going on. And so I think there's something about, for me, there's parallels in that in terms of what happens in healthcare, particularly with um, conversations with patients, often when they're facing difficult situations and whether the professionals actually share what they're worried about going on versus what the patient knows is, is happening. And we do that often to protect people, to protect people from their anxiety and to reassure them. And sometimes we do that as health professionals to protect ourselves from our own anxiety. So I'm wondering if part of the function of transformation is actually unconsciously, it's trying to protect us from facing difficult realities. And therefore, by doing that, we don't actually address what is going on. I think we often also observe this desire for positivity. And there's a fantastic book, again, I think, by someone called Bayong Chal Hun, called The Burnout Society. And he talks about the tyranny of positivity. Uh, and he describes a, a quote, which I think is quite interesting, is he just says, the violence of positivity does not deprive, it saturates. It does not exclude, it exhausts. And that is why it proves inaccessible to unmediated perception. And what he's saying is that because we have this pressure to be positive all the time and actually we don't feel it, we're leading to this sense of burnout. And I think there's something about being it's become really difficult to speak against because we get labelled as resistant to change or laggards, really derogatory language for people who are expressing concerns about what's going on. But at the same time, I feel very hopeful. Um, I see great work happening where care is being transformed all the time. People are organising differently. I'm a member of a wonderful WhatsApp group called Flourishing with a predominantly a group of GPs, actually, who are radically transforming the way that they're running their practices and engaging with their communities in completely different ways. And I have the privilege as a trustee of the Queen's Nursing Institute to judge the awards and some of the stuff that the nursing community teams are presenting in terms of what they're doing is just mind blowing. But we were also asked about characteristics of change, what characterises and distinguishes it from change that works and change that doesn't. Um, and that made me think about um, what do we mean about change that works? Works for whom? Who decides whether it's good change or not? And that the idea that everybody will agree on that. So we will have a variation around that. Um, and I think that's really difficult. Um, I think that, um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the film I, Daniel Blake, uh, but there's a fantastic scene in it where the um, somebody comes to gain their benefits and they're late. And the bureaucracy, bureaucratic process that kicks in that says that somebody can't be seen. And so there's the bureaucratic processes that we put in to try and make efficiency and productivity. And at the same time can detract from the sort of relational stuff about the work that we're in. Uh, we were also asked about some of our, I'm going through quite a lot because as Rich said, we had five minutes to cover a massive load of stuff. But in terms of practice of change, you know, we were asked about what are our favourite practical tools and techniques. So I'm a pragmatist. I think we need to be able to draw on a whole range of different, um, uh, different approaches. Uh, I think that they have to be informed by theory because I think we have an ethical responsibility to practice um, and be able to defend why we are saying what we're doing. We work in a system that deals with risk and emotional intensity and actually transforming and changing the way that care is organised and delivered has an impact. And so as OD practitioners, we need to be mindful of that. I suppose my I have some concerns around models. I think that uh, whilst they're helpful, they can be problematic because they're often written in the abstract. They are, uh, they're written as sort of a general principle and what I often observe is people get very fixated on trying to implement the model rather than focusing on what's actually really going on around here. But actually, what I do find helpful are practices which I would call as human ones. So that's dialogue, being engaging in dialogue. And there's a fantastic book written by Patricia Shaw called Changing Conversations in Organisations. By using data, qualitative and quantitative data, stories and narratives, 
I'm a big fan of Schwartz rounds where people start to hear the different experiences of what's going on, which transforms the way that people understand the situations and starts to respond differently. Co-production as well, making sure we've got a plurality of perspectives. I'm very conscious of time, Rich, and so sort of trying to close down. But I think one of the other things that we also ask is about politics and pressure of change. I think, you know, we have to be realistic. We work in a political system. Politicians are working to constraints too, and they will have all sorts of pressures. Um, but I think that it requires courage in order to do the work that we're, do we're doing. It requires ethics and morality, honesty about what's going on, to reject the textbooks that write the neat, abstracted, sort of post-rationalised view of change and recognise it's messy and complex. It does take time. And we were asked, how do we value the practice um, of the progress of incremental change? Well, I think we need to value it as practitioners. We need to be brave enough to say, this is messy, this is complex, it will take time, um, and, and sit with the uncertainty and the anxiety that that evokes from those around us. And now I'll pause. Stop. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> no, 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 Rebecca, do not apologise at all. Thank you. Let's show our appreciation. Rebecca, thank you. A huge amount of wisdom packed into a very short number of minutes we are very grateful uh thank you um if, if, were you expecting to come and get a reading list at the end of this if you weren't you will get one we will send that to you Rebecca thank you huge range of uh things for people to follow up I'm going to share my screen once more very briefly as uh we have a question for you so just reflecting on what you've heard from uh Tanya from Dan and from Rebecca what got you nodding uh, or shaking your head, uh, sort of vertically or horizontally, uh, most vigorously? So reflecting on everything you've heard from Tanya Dan Rebecca, what got you nodding or disagreeing uh, most vigorously and why? In the chat, please. That is B1 in the chat, B1. Uh, what I was saying is that when we close today, we'll be writing all of this up uh, and we'll be sharing sharing outputs back with you. So do watch out for that. Whilst responses on B1 are coming through, what we're going to do is just quickly pop back to our mentee questions. Uh, and Shane, I wonder if you just reflecting on everything we've heard uh, from Tanya, Dan and Rebecca, just want to give us um, a an, in a nutshell um, response to those top two questions. Um, and I think when we're talking about nutshell, we're probably talking about um, uh, peanuts uh, or pine nuts even maybe. Uh, but just those top two questions, Shane, your your quick response. Uh, yeah, so the, the 22, I think with all humility, this probably goes back to Dan's point, which is I think there's a, a danger of just the separation, even as an idea of business as usual, separate from transformation. Because the, 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 if we are to transform, the only way to transform is through business as, as usual. Um, so I think there's a little bit of false dichotomy there. I think also there is a danger of um, disempowering. So when we talk about transformation, uh, abs an abstract, you know, if I'm a porter or if I'm a you know a, a lower band uh, staff nurse or whoever it happens to be, it can it does feel like something else's job. It can become fetishized like improvement. But if you can offer up the smallest things, Mary Dixon Woods talks about a culture of noticing for better. If you start to cherish and point out the smallest things that you can do, if you're at Lucian McGrath with a staff of 7,000 people and you give them examples of small things that you can do, I think that that's the way in. So let's not talk about business as usual and transformation would be the place I would um, I would start. Um, and how do we balance hope and uh, ambition? Um, I think just sitting with that discomfort. Um, hope is a discipline um, and it's uh, it's a curious play friend you have to find hope in my experience it won't find you I think that is the work of leadership that sort of grounded hope but sit with the dissonance and be honest be honest about how difficult it is don't uh, don't rush past the reality and I think the other thing is do not let impatience steal what can be yours I think if I could say that to my younger self uh, uh, I think um, I, 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 we would all learn a lot do not let impatience steal what can be yours and celebrate the progress, celebrate the journey, not just racing the outcome. Keep an eye on your compass, not just the map. Um, Shane, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. We are racing towards two o'clock and where we're going to just finish 
if it's okay. So we're going to come back to to Dan and Rebecca and Shane. I'll, I'll come back to you at the very end. But we have our final question just for chat, which is, uh, we've got wonderful shared experience in the room. You've heard uh, from our speakers, but I'm sure across the dozens of us on the call, there's a decade of experience in, in exactly the issues we've been discussing. So last uh, question in the chat, what one piece of advice would you give on how to practically balance the reality of how change happens with what we've been talking about, the inevitable desire for transformation? Um, we're going to be uh, snappy. So we're going to come to Dan for your one piece of advice, please. And then Rebecca, uh, and then we'll move on. Dan, one piece of advice. Um, I, I think I, it's what I've already said, really, which I think we need to treat, treat change as indivisible from improvement. I think if you if you kind of hold that mindset, then it, you start to see the the transformation job completely differently um, because it does become about the ends, not the means. Um, so uh, that that's my piece of advice, really. Uh, transformation is indivisible from improvement. Focus on the ends, not the means. And lovely. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, and I suppose I would say, well, change is happening. You know, whether we think we're transforming or not, change is happening all the time. And it's an ongoing response to the context in which people find themselves. So I think sometimes we just need to let go and stop feeling quite so precious about the desire that we, as a transformation person, uh, perhaps have to do it. It's happening. Lovely. Um, I, I think if there's one thing which comes out of this, Rebecca, is that everyone will want to join your flourishing WhatsApp group uh, <laughs> just to just to be injected with that uh, with that hope. Uh, Shane, your your quick response on this. Um, I would uh, I would say to remember that you're not alone, um, and uh, it, it can feel like a lonely pursuit, the pursuit of change and transformation, particularly when there's so much despair. I would just encourage a very simple practice as practice of noticing celebrating, encouraging, and remembering that hope is uh, is a discipline. And I think that's the work that is available to all of us. Um, uh, and we just need to hold on to that and each other. Um, Shane, Rebecca, Dan, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for everyone's responses uh, in chat. Paul trying to do less in order to do more, making it real. Lorna, I love that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Chris, your point about small changes making a big different um yes point about speed of trust Ben. thanks so much for highlighting that please do keep on sharing again we will be taking all of this and playing it back to you um so please do keep on sharing in our last in our last few seconds together just to say uh would love this is a conversation we'd love to continue uh, you may be coming across Glidescope for the first time, uh, or you might have been aware of us for a while. Um, if uh, we can at all help with your um, transformation, inverted commas, uh, journey in terms of organisation development, team <laughs> leadership, uh, change management, do get in touch for a real or virtual uh, coffee. Um, do join our newsletter if not already done so to receive more information. Um, and do join us for another event, such as the event we've got coming up. Uh, in January, registration uh, live as of 90 minutes ago, uh, where we're going to be getting into how you are concrete about collaboration. How do we make sure that when we talk about collaboration and strengthening collaboration, this doesn't become a vague and amorphous mess? Uh, join us in January for that. We will post the link into chat. Uh, but for now, we will once again thank our panel, uh, Rebecca. Dan, Tanya and Shane, uh, thank you so much for joining. We hope you've uh, found this constructive. We're going to post an evaluation form in chat. Please, please uh, have a chance to fill that in. It's already there. Thank you. Uh, and welcome any further reflections by email. We hope you have excellent rest of Thursday afternoon. So if you're joining from Minnesota, uh, rest of your day, you've got, a, you've got an advantage now, Sheila. Thank you all. And we hope to see you again at a future event. Thanks all. <laughs>